All right, guys, welcome back. This is going to be pretty much the start of the second half of the year for you. So we should have just finished up uh, learning about uh, the Civil War and uh, the aftermath of that Civil War time period called Reconstruction. So let's get it going. And uh, today we're going to look at the rise of American business and industry from 1865 to about 1920. Uh, if you're not quite sure what big business we're talking about, one of them is going to be steel. So I'll give you a picture right there of a nice little steel factory from the, uh, the late 1800s. Uh, as we keep going, I'm going to do a comparison here between the north and the south, just to give you an idea of what is happening up north versus what is happening down south. So I'll move pretty quick because most of this should be pretty uh, easily understandable for you. Uh, first of all, industrialization, that's factory work, really accelerates in the north during the Civil War. Why? Production. They were producing guns, ammunition, uniforms, wartime products. So the factories were really humming during the Civil War. They're going to continue to hum after the Civil War. All right? Farms, especially uh, you know during the, the summer months up in the northwest, the northeast and out west, they have become more mechanized, which means uh, we have more machines doing the work, which means means we have fewer workers to needed to produce certain crops. So what happened is people began to move from the farms to the cities. You're going to see this happening in America in the late 1800s. Why? What's in the cities? The factory work, the jobs in factories. That is called urbanization. It's a great vocab term, shows up on the exam. So what's urbanization? Think of urban centers, people moving from farms to cities. You should study that, all right? Uh, after the Civil War, Northern factories began searching for new markets to sell their excess products. So we're going to be selling products to everybody in America, and we're going to begin to look for markets overseas. We had to transport these products to new markets and people out west. So our nation began building what were called transcontinental railroads, railroads that span across the entire country. You're going to see at least four major transcontinental systems develop in America late 1800s. All right. Uh, economic growth, those jobs, the attractions brought new immigrants to our nation. We're going to talk, there's a whole separate video of the new immigrants who are coming to the country. All right? Some of those immigrants are going to find their way out west to work on those farms, but the majority of them, most of them are going to find work in the factory cities of the north. So that gives you a quick snapshot of what, what is happening up north right after the Civil War. At the same time, we want to take a, a snapshot of the South, right? And that's going to be pretty easy as well. Uh, the Civil War ruined the South's economy. It was traditionally uh, an agricultural-based economy uh, where they raised cotton, tobacco, rice, and indigo. And the South really wants to reinvent itself and, and change it from only being agricultural to doing more of the manufacturing. And they, they do do that to a certain degree. Slavery is going to end. So the plantation system also ends, and we know that plantation owners found former slaves and poor white people to do work as sharecroppers. That was a great vocab term from one of our earlier videos, so make sure you know sharecropping, all right? Uh, what did the South look like? It was deplorable. It was in bad shape, okay? Farms were burned. Railroads were, were ripped up. Southern factories destroyed. Really, the South... Even it got rebuilt during Reconstruction, they still had some work to go, all right? Despite those hardships, though, those southern farms began to produce those cash crops again. The South will experience some industrialization, but for the most part, they are going to maintain their agricultural status, all right? Southern leaders did not feel the economy should be based on farming alone. So they began to change what was done down south. So the term for this we're going to use is, we're going to call it the New South, right? The New South is a, a vocab term describing what the South looks like after the Civil War is over. It also is used to describe some of the race relations that developed on South. So what, how did the South's economy change? You should be aware of this. So predominantly agriculture, still farming cotton and tobacco, but we're going to rebuild those railroads. There are some textile mills being built down South. There are a few steel mills down South. There's new industries opening up, like, you know, digging for oil and digging for coal in certain mountainsides, certain areas of the South. So they continue to try to industrialize, but... They are going to lag behind the north, right? They aren't going to industrialize as much as they want to, all right? How do we know that? Most of the jobs down south are still 
agricultural, predominantly agricultural. So most of the people down south are still farming. We do know, or we, we should have remembered from Reconstruction, that poor whites and former slaves are going to farm on lands that are owned by others. They don't own their own land. And specifically, what's the name for that? That is sharecropping. And, and I went through that in the last video. So if you're not clear on sharecropping, you may want to go back and review that, all right? Uh, where you would farm an entire, you know, plantation and you would get part of that harvest um, as part of your payment. So I'm not going to go into detail on that. I've already done, right? The other way to do it would be tenant farming, uh, slightly different. You had a little bit of money and you actually rented a corner of someone's land. Uh, and that's how you were able to, to make your money. And then hopefully you made a little money and by the next you know, crop season, you could rent a larger piece of land. So sharecropping, bottom of the barrel, slightly above that would be tenant farmers. And if you wanted to be a kind of a somebody or a rich guy down south, you were one of the land owners, right? But uh, here's something you may want to be aware of. It does not happen right away, but beginning in the late 1880s, so long after the Civil War, long after Reconstruction, there were some African Americans who began to migrate north. They got out of the south, some of them as fast as they possibly could, right? What you're going to see is this will accelerate during and after both of the world wars. So there's going to be incredible African American migration to northern cities, uh, slightly before World War One, but definitely after World War One and during World War Two. So you'll see that coming. All right. If you need that uh, vocab for your sheet, you can pause that and snag that. I'm going to keep moving for you. All right. There are going to be tremendous different business develops developments during the late 1800s, and I'll take you through that. Uh, before the Civil War, most people who owned businesses were single owners. They may have had some partnerships, uh, and those people controlled most of American businesses, all right? Single-owned mom-and-pop shops. That is going to change. After the Civil War, a new business structure kind of emerges, and these are called larger businesses. You may refer to them as corporations, all right? Many kind of people put, pool their money together, and they build a huge factory, a huge business, all right? But they needed more money. So that led to new forms of business structures, and that is going to be what? Corporations. The more money you have, the larger your operation can be, and hopefully the more money you're going to make. So if you're not sure of a corporation, I'll take you through that now. All right. A uh, corporation is a business in which many people, investors, put their money into that business. So the, what, what does that mean? They then own shares, and we usually call those shares stocks. In exchange for that initial investment, that stockholder, that guy who gave the company the money, is going to receive a dividend or part of the corporation's profits for as long as they own the stock. It's a pretty simple business structure. If the company does well, you get more money back in your stocks. If the company does bad, you're not going to get your money back. So that's the new business structure that was arranged. So if you want to look at some corporations, give you some examples throughout the uh, United States that you'll find. All right. Uh, if you like drinking that Dr. Pepper, you know, it's, it's there. You know, they're making it. Uh, if you need that uh, vocabulary, go ahead and snag it. I'm going to keep moving. Uh, why do we see the, the, the growth in corporations, right? The money that was raised speeded the growth of American industry because now, now you had these larger businesses, these larger operations. And what, what, what kind of companies got into that? I'll give you some examples. The fastest growing industries in the late 1800s were in transportation, transporting people, transporting supplies, transporting goods or services, right? And you're going to see that obviously what is built, railroads, Urban transports in city areas like uh, little city railways, streetcars, and even subways. And later on in the 19 teens, automobiles. So, what business materials kind of spawned or really was used in the late 1800s? That is going to be steel. There was a few new energy resources that developed. We always had coal, coal we burn for fuel, but the new one that kind of comes out in the late 1800s is oil. We start using oil for kerosene for lamps and gasoline for our engines, and then by the turn of the century, by 1900, the best of all is going to be electricity. You walk in the room and flick the switch. You plug in your, your hair dryer, your iron, your whatever, your chainsaw, you know. So there's a lot of electric products that come out in the late 18, early 1900s. Uh, communications definitely develops. We had the telegraph since like the 1840s. By the 1870s, we have the telephone. Eventually, we have the radio where we can transport uh, different information for people. So 
and the early uh, early yeah, or the telephone. Nice little picture there showing you early telephone. Uh, there are going to be other forms of business organization. So if you don't know what a monopoly is, I need to take you through that, but I want you to pay really specific attention to the term trust when we get to it by the end of this uh, couple slides here. So monopoly is pretty easy to get. It's a company or a small group of companies that have complete control of a particular product. What does that mean? They are the only company that manufactures that product. And if you have that monopoly, then you can charge whatever you want. So when you look at bullet number two here, having that monopoly allows a company to raise their prices to almost any level it desired. All right? These abuses led the federal government eventually to step in and create laws to stop monopolies, to bring prices down, because that's going to be fair for people. All right. So you should know what a monopoly is. All right? I think I'm going to define it for you later on, so you need it. The, one of the major first big monopolies that happened was, a, that's John D. Rockefeller. Look at him controlling the world because he's refining oil. And if you want that kerosene in your lamp, guess who you got to buy it from? Yeah, that's right, John D. Rockefeller. And notice he is sitting on just bags of cash because that dude made a ton of money. All right. So if you need that vocabulary, it's there. I'm going to keep rolling. Two other smaller business organizations, not usually seen on U.S. regions exams, but you may want to know them. So a uh, conglomerate would be a corporation that owns a group of unrelated companies, thereby controlling the, the certain products that kind of make one particular uh, service or product. A merger would be one company acquiring another company that makes the same product. So those are just different types of um business structures that were formed in the late 1800s. Now, pooling is done by railroads. So what you usually have is multiple railroads or multiple railroad companies would be going through one particular city. Instead of competing with each other and keeping prices low, they would actually fix prices and divide the profits. So those two railroad companies going through your little town, they would all jack up their prices and make you pay it, and then they would split up the cash. So that's called pooling money, all right? Uh, the, the new, really new business structure that comes out is a trust. And a trust, what you need to know is a trust is a form of a monopoly, all right? A form of monopoly. So what it is, is it's a group of companies. So let's company A, company B, company C, company D, a whole bunch of different companies. They all make the same product. But it's not a monopoly. It doesn't look like a monopoly because they're all different companies, but they're all working together and they all agree they're going to sell their product at a very high price. And that is going to hurt you and me, the consumer. All right? So trust, if you're a business and you own that trust and you're all working together, the business owners are going to make a ton of money. But who has to pay more for it? We do the people. All right? So your example there is going to be standard oil trust. So make sure you know that. Uh, I got a cool little timeline here. By the way, look at the steel trust, copper trust, standard oil trust. All of these guys are big business owners. And what they're kind of showing you here, they are the bosses of the Senate. This is the time period of laissez-faire where the Senate, our government, did not make any rules against these companies. And all these business owners were getting fat, meaning they got what? Let's see the dollar signs. These dudes were making a boatload of money, a ton of money. Right? And at this time, the government didn't do anything about it. It's called laissez-faire. Right? If you need that vocabulary, you can pause that and snag that. So what are just some kind of short little quick hits for you if you need them? Uh, nice little quick timeline. Uh, shows and proves the typewriter. What we know about the late 1800s, it's a time of great inventions and changes in things, just like Alexander Graham Bell, who invents the telephone. All right? Uh, Standard Oil Trust is formed in 1882. It's a monopoly, and they jacked up the price for oil. Carnegie Steel is formed in 1892, and Carnegie is pretty much the only one producing steel because of vertical consolidation or integration, which you learn about in class. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of labor strikes in the late 1800s. None of them will be successful. Uh, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. A bunch of women form their own union in textile industries to benefit themselves in terms of better pay or better working conditions. And then by the 1913, by the 19 teens, the assembly line is basically introduced and it's hopping in uh, one of Ford's factories. 
and he was able to produce the automobile very inexpensively. So people were able to afford buying a car. So all those are just little events that are happening through the late 18, early 1900s. Let's talk about some, some quick innovations and cool things that are happening, things that you've seen in your lifetime, but you never really know when they, uh, they came about. So uh, certain innovations are going to help businesses, number one, get their product out there and get people to want to buy it. So that's pretty simple. So the first one we see is really large department stores, the one-stop shop. So you would go to a store and you can get a variety of goods in one place. So if you don't know what you're, you're thinking of a department store like Sears, um, Kaufman's, you know, one of those types of stores where you can go, you can get clothes, you can get a blender, you can get everything in a one-stop shop. And once again, where would you find them? You'd find them in the urban areas. Think of like a mall today. A mall is like a hot you know, huge department store, you get whatever you want, right? The other way that business is, once again, what's the key here? You got to get your product out there, make people see it so they want to buy it. And the other one is sending people these little mail order catalogs. And why would they send them to rural areas, to farmers? Because farmers can't afford maybe to drive to the department store every every week or every day. Well, don't worry about it. The little train that's cutting through your town, we're going to send you the stuff. All you got to do is order it. Pay and order it. So mail order catalogs offered items from department stores and delivered them right to the towns of those little farm communities. So those people were still able to buy those products. Then what the heck are you going to buy in the late 1800s? Well, all of the new inventions. So these are things that, that you may think about, hey, those, uh, I know what those are. But back then when it first came out, think about that new video game. You got to go get it, right? So here it is. One of the new inventions, the vacuum cleaner. Ooh, people used to sweep their rugs, right? Now they're just going to use the machine. Telephone, the electric light bulb, the iron, safety razor, the toaster, you name it. So new inventions are going to make people want to buy, uh, you know, for their home, for you know, whatever they're going to use, right? Oh, there's the little, there's the old vacuum cleaner, not the new vacuum cleaner. For those people, it was new. Our vacuum cleaners look a little different than that, right? And then the iron. Uh, back in the day, you used to have to take this metal thing and actually put it in the stove to heat it up. Now what can you do? You plug it in, right? So there's some new inventions for you. Entrepreneurs are going to be your businessmen, all right? These are people who take responsibility for organizing, operating, starting a new business. They're taking a huge risk, but they're hoping that their business is going to be profitable and they're going to make a ton of money. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, four businessmen right now and uh, a couple of them we've actually uh, looked at in class. So let's talk about Andrew Carnegie. He's a poor immigrant from Scotland. I mean, this guy came to America uh, in rags. I mean, he was really broke, uh, but he worked hard. He started working at a textile factory at age 12. How many of you were out there working at age 12? Oh, my God. Um, and he really, he worked hard. He invested his money. At age 38, he enters the steel industry. He saw America's future in steel. He uses what is called vertical integration and control all the aspects of the steel industry. And let me tell you something. He became the largest producer of steel in the entire world, right? He sold his company for over $400 million to John Morgan, J.P. Morgan. Uh, he did also engage in philanthropy. That's one of those vocab words that kids forget. Philanthropy. You got a lot of money, so you give it away. So these people gave money to certain charities, specifically libraries and cultural centers and things like that. Who is that? You got it. That's my boy, Andrew Carnegie. Pretty smart businessman, right? And what's he saying? He's got a lot of money from Scotland. He's wearing a little kilt. And what's he doing? He's giving that money to certain little people libraries, universities, communities. If you go to New York City, a nice center for the arts would be Carnegie Hall. And he engaged in what? Vertical consolidation. He owned the shipping. He owned the, the boats. He owned the steel mill. He owned the iron ore. He owned the coke mines. He built it all. And this is called vertical consolidation. When you control all phases of production, right? The other guy on the hand is John D. Rockefeller. Uh, he entered the oil refining business during the Civil War. Once again, oil, you dig it up, it's black, you can't use it. You have to change its chemical property so you can use it. But what he did 
was he used ruthless methods to get rid of his competitors, and that was called horizontal integration. By 1882, he controlled 90% of American oil refining. He created a monopoly. He was the only guy refining oil, right? Later, when the government said, hey, man, you can't have that monopoly, he formed what was known as Standard Oil Trust. And it was a bunch of separate oil companies that acted as one, and uh, he made a ton of money. And what did he do? He also gave away hundreds of millions of dollars to charities. Now, why did he do this? Made himself look like a pretty good dude, didn't he? Who was that? That's my man, John D. Rockefeller. He does not engage in vertical consolidation originally. He engages in what? Horizontal. So he controlled all the other oil companies to create one oil company. All right. Um, J.P. Morgan. Who is he? A banker, financier. He is a guy who starts out with just a ton of capital, which is money to get started. So he made his money in banking, but uh, he also started to buy other bankrupt railroad companies. And uh, he was controlling some of the shipping that was out there. Um, electrical companies, insurance companies, shipping companies, railroads, and banks. This guy had a ton of money. So what he wanted, and he did in 1901, he actually buys Carnegie Steel from... Andrew Carnegie, and created a company known as United States Steel Corporation. By the way, it is, there's, he's, look at him, he's ruthless, right? It is the first billion dollar a year industry. It's called U.S. Steel. There's John, J.P. Morgan, beast, right? Uh, and he yelled at somebody, he got mad probably. Somebody said, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, and he did it anyway. Uh, Henry Ford, another entrepreneur. So we looked at Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and finally, Henry Ford. Uh, he was an entrepreneur who revolutionized, changed the way that people made automobiles. Originally, uh, how did we make automobiles? One guy would build the car from soup to nuts, from the tires all the way to the engine, to the roof, and then sell it. Well, that took a long time. So what Henry Ford wanted to do was mass produce these cars, create an assembly line. It lowered the cost of production. So he could sell cars cheaper than anybody else. And basically, that dude sold a lot of cars. You may see his name still today, right? Look at this. I mean, that's Henry Ford. Look at this. Unbelievable. Ford. Buy it because it's a better car. It's 650 bucks for the Model T. And before this time period, if you were to buy that car, it would probably cost you like $2,000. But with the assembly line, they could produce it quicker and cheaper than anyone else. So now the cost of the car goes down. More and more people are going to buy the automobile. All right. What's that? What are you looking at? You better know. It's an assembly line, right? So this guy does that all day long. And that, that guy does his part all day long. And that guy does his job. And the cars just keep running, humming. Uh, that's what factory looks, uh, work looks like today. Although you probably today see more machines than people, right? Um, vocabulary, you got to know what an assembly line is. You associate with that with Henry Ford, right? There are going to be some attitudes towards business. Should people be doing this or not? Um, and some are positive and some are negative. So let's just take a peek. Traditional attitudes were found in books written by Horatio Alger Jr. If you don't know him from class, you forgot him. You're going to get it again right here. Horatio Alger focused on people's individual efforts. So if you read any of his stories, they're about poor boys who got rich. They're the Andrew Carnegie story by working hard. We give a name to these stories, right? They're called the rags to riches. You came to America poor. You're walking out rich, baby, because you work hard and made it, all right? His novels also illustrated, if you go back to the colonial day, the idea of the Puritan work ethic, right? If you work hard, it's going to build your character. It's going to make you a better person. And that hard work and that, that toiling, that itself is its own reward. You feel good about yourself when you accomplish something. So that's the, what, what his attitude was towards the, the working field. So you got to drip in New York, you know, Horatio Alger Jr. There's a book by him. Bound to Rise, little boy working hard as a little shoe cobbler. Eventually, he's going to own the shoe store, right? Uh, from rags to riches, the American dream. Immigrants come poor, you work hard, you get rich. Right? Now, there are some governmental attitudes towards business. And the first one that you should focus on is laissez-faire, lazy government. 
It's the idea that the government should not interfere in the economic workings of a nation, should not tell private businesses what to do. Let Andrew Carnegie do what he needs to do. Let John Morgan do what he needs to do. Leave business alone. That's laissez-faire. And to couple that, to go with that, is the free enterprise system, right? Private individuals make all the economic decisions. The government does not get involved. Just let it flow. Let it happen. And that pretty much was the government's attitude in the late 1800s. The government did not get involved. Uh, if you need the vocab, I got it for you, but there's one more that goes along with it, and that is social Darwinism. Now, you know who likes social Darwinism? Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford. They're like, listen, we're rich and our companies are great because we're great leaders. Leave us alone. So they, they used what Charles Darwin said about the birds in evolution. And if you remember anything from your science classes, what happens out in nature? It's called the survival of the fittest. Rich birds survive, weak birds die. And does anybody mess with the birds? No, just let it happen. So they took that theory and they applied it to the business world. And they said, hey, weak businesses are going to fail simply because they are weak and inferior. Strong businesses are going to survive because they're better run businesses. And to go along with that, the government should not mess with those businesses. Keep the government out of it. Just let it flow. Let businesses do what businesses do. All right? So if you need that vocab for social Darwinism, it's there for you, right? Now, there's two different ways we can look at these, these business uh, owners, these entrepreneurs, if you will, all right? Number one, uh, we can call them either robber barons or captains of industry. So I'm going to give you both of those in a minute here, right? Uh, there was a big gulf. There was a big rift between rich and poor. And some Americans began criticizing laissez-faire. They saying, hey, wait a second. Maybe the government should get involved, right? Uh, and this viewpoint, those people who feel that the government needs to help them would be calling the uh, entrepreneurs robber barons. So who are these robber barons? These are the rich, the industrialists who gained their money by ruthless methods and jacking up their prices, and who hurts? The poor people, right? So that's what robber barons are, right? Um, philanthropists or the rich industrialists like Carnegie and Rockefeller who donated their vast sums of money to different charities, they're going to call themselves, they're going to say, hey, we're not robber barons. We're just captains of our industry. We're smart businessmen. And look at all the good we're doing. Leave us alone. The government should stick with laissez-faire, right? Uh, now the question arises, did the rich donate money because they were good people? Or did they want to look like good people so the government would keep to laissez-faire and leave their businesses alone? I'm not going to answer that question. That's up to you, right? So we're going to take all oh, this is phenomenal, right? The protectors of our industry. Like who's protecting these industries? Look at all these people working, working, and who's getting fat, right? Uh, you know, Robbie Gould and Vanderbilt and all the, these rich guys up here, right? And what's in store for these people? Look down here. You see it? Bottom right. Hard times long hours low pay sucks for the people these rich dudes are just getting fat right looking good so we're going to take a look at government policies towards businesses and then what the government is going to do about these business structures all right so government really didn't do anything to big business in the late 1800s they actually aided them by doing nothing by what's called laissez-faire, right? They gave actual money. They gave land to railroad companies. They increased tariffs that made foreign products more expensive so that discouraged manufacturing, uh, or, I'm sorry, discouraged competition from other manufacturers. So it helped those people sell their products in America. And they actually tightened the limits on the amount of money in circulation, which actually increased prices. Well, increased prices, making sure your products are sold, help from the government, no rules. That allows people who own businesses to make a lot of money. Plus, they had a bunch of immigrants walking in and working in their factory for peanuts. So it looks to me, in the late 1800s, the government helped private businesses. To go along with that, the government began to say, hey, we might want to get our hands in there. In the late 1800s, the federal government actually began 
to regulate businesses. So they're going to tell private businesses what they can and can't do. So why did they do that? Well, there were certain downturns or certain kind of mini, mini recessions or depressions in the national economy. And the government wanted to keep the economy rolling. There was a lot of criticism against the practices that saw big business make a ton of money at the expense of the working class and the poor people. The rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. Some people felt the government needs to step in. All right. There was also some small movements, grassroots political movements, to put pressure on the government to begin to regulate, to begin to change things. So we're going to talk about the Supreme Court and then the actual Congress in a minute. There's two court decisions that actually, you can just kind of see where the Supreme Court was on business. So let's take a look at both of them and we'll put them together. In Munn versus Illinois, 1877, late 1800s, the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government is not allowed to, or I'm sorry, the federal government could regulate grain elevator rates only in Illinois because the private business affected what? Affects the public. So the Supreme Court began to stick their head into that business. They said, we're going to keep an eye on your elevator rates in Illinois. Right. And then in the Wabash case in 1886, the Supreme Court ruled that the state they go like, states could not regulate railroad rates on the portions of interstate routes. But the federal government could. So the federal government was allowed to tell railroads what they can charge and how much they can charge. But they actually did it. Why? What is the mood of the federal government? laissez-faire. The government wasn't doing anything. Although the Supreme Court said the government could do it, they did not. Now, when does that all change? You should know about the Interstate Commerce Commission. If you don't pay close attention right now, by 1887, there was so much pressure for reform, Congress created a law that is still around today. What is the law? The Interstate Commerce Act the act is the law, and it creates the Interstate Commerce Commission. So if you don't see the ICC, there it is. What does it do? The ICC ended railroad pooling, railroad abuses, and railroads who were jacking up their prices. They basically told railroads, your prices have to be fair, and we will be watching. This is a step away from the government doing nothing. Now the government is doing something. All right. It also ended discounts. So a, a railroad company might give Andrew Carnegie like a huge discount, but it wouldn't give it to the local farmer. Well, the ICC says, listen, if you're going to give a discount, you have to offer that discount to all of your customers. It can't just be your buddy. All right. Although the Supreme Court kept the commission ineffective for a bunch of years, the establishment setting this precedent for the ICC will actually change the federal government's position to private business. They weren't going to regulate businesses. Now they are. How can they do it? Because it's interstate commerce. It says so in the United States Constitution. Let's bring this thing home. The last piece. The Sherman Antitrust Act created by the government in 1890. I like the name of the law because it tells you exactly what it's designed to do. You break up that trust, break up standard oil trust. So by the late 1800s, large companies, trust, had gotten rid of competition, created monopolies, and these companies are jacking their prices up. Well, what's the Sherman Antitrust Act say? It prohibited these companies from doing that. It said trusts were illegal. You can't do that to people, right? Now, although the government didn't enforce this law until after 1900, is it still a good law? I think we can agree. That's a yes. So it's hanging around for 10 years. Eventually, the government starts to use it. And you'll see Teddy Roosevelt use it, all right? And then finally, the United States versus E.C. Knight Company, the Supreme Court ruled that many businesses were exempt from the law. So for a while, it kind of kept businesses safe. The court was protecting them, but eventually the government is going to step in. So I want you to pay close attention to the few questions I have at the end of this, this sheet for you. you know, make sure you answer those, do the vocab, study, 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 and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again.